Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, a big thank you for, for coming along today. Um, we're talking about people with learning disabilities in Ukraine. Um, the the thought for this idea, the thought for this webinar came from uh, Chris Nightingale uh, from the University of East Anglia. She approached me and asked, what are we going to do about it? Because it, um, we, we're seeing about the war on the news and, and the impact, and that has an impact on all of us. Um, and what are we doing about people with learning disabilities that are there? Um, the first thing that, that struck my mind is how difficult it is for people with learning disabilities that we support when small changes happen like their route to ASDA perhaps and how distressing that can be for them uh, and then thinking about how how devastating it must be to have such such wide-reaching effects as, as currently happening so we um we agreed we were going to do a webinar about it to help share what's happening um, and we found out about the great work of um, Enable Scotland and Inclusion Europe. Um, so we're very pleased to be joined by um, Jan and Milan today. Um, I'm Jonathan Beebe. I'm the professional lead for the Royal College of Nursing. If we go around to the other people who are here to present, so we've got Chris. Yes, hello, I'm Chris Nightingale. I'm um, Associate Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of East Anglia. I'm also a learning disability nurse by um, train, by profession, by vocation as well. Thank you. Jan? Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Jan Savage and I am Director of Enable Scotland's Charity Services. Um, for those of you who, who know Enable, um, we are Scotland's largest and oldest um, organisation uh, representing the human rights of all people who have learning disabilities and their families in Scotland. Um, we are also a founding member of the Inclusion Europe Partnership almost 30 years ago now, I think, Milan. Um, not that either of us were around at, at that time, um, but we're really proud to continue that partnership um, to this day. Um, so great to see you today. Thank you, Jen. And Milan? Uh, yes, uh, hello everybody. My name is Milan Šorepa. I'm Director of Inclusion Europe. We are an association representing uh, 20 million of people with intellectual disabilities and their families with members uh, across 39 European countries, uh, such as Enable, and uh, also with members in Ukraine. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess that's enough of an introduction. We'll get to the details later. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Van. Um, so uh, just some housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. Your mics and cameras have been disabled, um, so there won't be anything from you personally shared, but your your name may be visible to people who uh, watch back the recording. So if, um, if you're not happy with that, then you need to take action to resolve it. Um, also just wanted to highlight um, that you know, we, we're talking about things that are traumatic and you may be personally affected by it. Um, we, we may be talking about um, things or showing images of things that are um, traumatic for you. Um, please look after yourselves. Please seek support where you where you can. You, uh, I'm sure most of your workplaces will have support. I will pop in the chat in a moment the member support services from the RCN for, for members of the RCN. Um, but yeah, please do look after yourselves. And please also, a lot of us are working from home at the moment, so please be aware if other people are around, particularly children, that they may find um, some of the content distressing. Um, and the last couple of points here as well is just just a reminder to all that we're not involved in the politics uh, of what's happening in Ukraine at any way. Um, the people that are affected by what's happening haven't asked for this at all. Um, and we are purely focusing on the humanitarian crisis that's happening in there. Uh, we want to raise awareness about that and look at what we can do about it. Um, it says about we've got a zero tolerance to hate speech, so if there is any inappropriate content, we will be deleting it and removing people if necessary, but I'm, I'm sure that won't be the case. So that's the uh, introduction started off. Now, I think... Sorry, I, I think I'm seeing Raisa now, so we should have her now. Oh, fantastic. OK, well, we'll, we'll just sort out the, the technology of making Razor a presenter. Um, 
Yeah. Could I, while, while we're just doing that, I'm just trying to find um, her name in the list. I'm sorry, I really can't find her name in the list. Could you just help me there, M Milan, please? You may be able to do it yourself. You may be able to click on and make her a presenter. So in the meantime, I would also just like to introduce that we've got two other presenters on the call as well, um, who are my colleagues in at the University of East Anglia, which is Hannah Brooks and Kirsty Henry. Uh, Kirsty is the uh, course director for the Learning Disability Nursing course, and Hannah is another colleague who's also a Learning Disability Nursing lecturer, and they will be looking up, watching the chat for us, and they may be responding to some of the questions as well, because they've got um, a huge amount of expertise in uh, supporting people with learning disabilities and carers. So please do interact through the chat. Please put any comments in there or questions. And, and for questions, we'll try and come to them towards the end. Sorry, Chris. Thank you. Milan, did you manage to get your colleague in as a presenter? I, I can only do make an attendee. OK, can you just spell the name for me? Sorry colleagues um, it's, on the it's, call. It's, um, I'm sorry, it's it's written in Cyrillic, so it will Oh, help. right, OK. <laughs> so you have to look, look out for the presenter in Cyrillic, and that, that, that's Reza. Um, I'm wondering, in, in while we do that, maybe we could show the video that we wanted yes, to please. show. Yes, uh, So I'll stop presenting. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Kirsty. This is just a short video that, that shows some of what's been happening. The young men have been working all night. They try to bring some cheer to the old woman. How is our service, they joke. Can we give you tea or coffee? It spares none, this war, not the old, the young or the sick. These children from Kharkiv are orphans. They have special needs and serious health conditions. Their distress is difficult to watch. But it is an essential truth of the war's destruction for those who are their carers. It's very deplorable. We are being bombed from morning till night. We've been in the bomb shelter all this time. All the kids, all of them. This is what they're fleeing. The destruction that's broken the calm, ordered life they knew. Uprooting a million and a half people so far. The bus is heading to the Polish border. care and nurturing travel with them. We are tired and you hear how the children behave. They also want calm, silence, coziness and warmth. What do these children mean to you? <laughs> Many people ask me why I do this job. I feel that I'm needed here. Just when you think that this war cannot get any more obscene in the way that it ruptures human lives, no matter how young, it does. And the sobering, sad thought is that it will continue to do so. They've been traveling 30 hours already. There are many more hours ahead. Fergal King, BBC News, Lviv. Uh, that news item was recorded on day five of, of this conflict um, and we, we're now on day 21, I think it is. But um, things have, have obviously escalated a lot more since then and, and the conditions have got a lot worse. Um, but that gives some insight into some of the challenges that, that people are facing at the moment. Uh, Chris, I think next week, if we can come yeah. to you, and you, you're going to share um some of your um experiences uh, and and uh, talking about um post-traumatic stress disorder as well in in a wartime okay thank you uh so 
Thank, thank you. As as uh, Jonathan said, uh, I approached Jonathan because I was hugely concerned, and uh, I, I find the images very traumatising. And uh, many years ago, more than thirty years ago, I myself entered uh, the former Yugoslavia during during the war um, to assess the aid the aid needs for a learning disability hospital that was in the middle of the conflict. So. Uh, this was a time when there was a no-fly zone. We had to drive across Europe to get into into the country and to visit the hospital. And so uh, the sort of things I saw there were, you know, there was a learning disability hospital with uh, several hundred people there, from very small children through to uh, senior adults uh, living in in there. Uh, there were people who had also recently joined the hospital as a place of safety because they they themselves as learning disabled adults had been fleeing more war torn areas of the region and so were actually experienced quite a lot of trauma um, and were very anxious when something was dropped if there was a loud bang or or any of those sorts of things so you know they were already showing um, early signs of um, ex ex of reactions to the, the trauma that they experienced. And of course, you know, because of what happens in wars, um, resources don't come in. So they had little to no resources to look after the people in the hospital. Some of the staff, like I'm sure has happened in Ukraine, staff need to flee as well. Um, and so there were, there were few people looking after the children and adults whilst I was there. And although I was there, Essentially, I'd been asked to, to assess what aid was needed. Uh, clearly, um, with my professional background, what I did was rolled up my sleeves and helped while I was there and worked alongside alongside the other carers and um, delivering care to the people who were there. Uh, the most significant things were the fact, although they could get food, it was the summertime, so there was you know good resources in terms of plant food. Um, they had very little in the way of uh, cleaning equipment, so you can imagine that the risk of disease um, was high and they had little in the way of medication as well. So I did see traumatic images, I saw people having to be um, restrained to some extent to prevent them from self-harming uh, because they couldn't have their usual medication um, and so you know it there, there are implications within all, all of these things in terms of people's resources. And I, I, I am hoping to do a full um, literature review, but I thought I'd just put a few put some points to again contextualize uh, why we're talking about this. And you know the issues for all of us is that we all need to have that sense of safety and belonging and well-being and you know being valued in a community. And you know what we see in these times of conflict is obviously communities are being destroyed, and that clearly has an impact on people's sense of belonging anywhere and being able to trust people, feeling welcome, and their sense of of their sense of well-being. So. Um, victim. So also we get that sense of um, distrust and victimisation. So. Sorry, this hasn't been well edited. I do apologise for that. Um, this this has all been done quite quickly. Um, so people rely on support from others um, who are not stigmatised, but it does mean that people can't go out on their own. They can't interact with other communities. They are very reliant on others. So they send, they lose their sense of I identity, and identity is a really big problem. Um, so we also have uh, risk factors um, for people with learning disability, which we already know about. Um, uh, you know that people with learning disabilities have higher health inequalities than other people in the communities. So things like poverty, poor housing, and exclusion from community participation, um, and all the sort of things like commun uh, communication bar barriers, are exacerbating people's risk um, for for poor health outcomes. So, you know, and that's when things are as they are normally, let alone when, you know, we've got conflict going on. So the risk for people with learning disabilities is much, much higher 
when when um, things are so uncertain. And I just wanted to quickly de define violence as well. So the World Health Organization definition of violence is the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment or deprivation. So again, you know, we're talking about people may not be in the direct line of, of um, the violence, but they're certainly impacted by that. And I'm sure we'll be hearing about people who are in both of those situations today. Um, so if I just move on. So again, just to think about trauma. Uh, so as I said, I just wanted to put some definitions here. Um, so from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and we talk about um, trauma, an A1 trauma as defined means that someone is more likely to be impacted by things like post-traumatic stress disorders, so the after effects of experiencing a trauma. So the definition is a person must have experienced, witnessed or been confronted with an event that involves actual or threatened death or injury or a threat to the physical integrity of themselves or others. I think, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, we're in that situation now. And, you know, research has also shown that there is a real strong relationship between negative life events. Um, and there are scales for measuring post-traumatic stress disorder for people with intellectual dis disabilities um, of um, psychological and behavioural problems um, after the event. Uh, and clearly, you know, that, that's a challenge for us all. Uh, there, um, there are also other um, clinically significant um, events. So we also talk about things like uh, where people have experienced trauma, that they might also experience other clinically significant events, which may, on the face of it, uh, seem quite disconnected from the trauma. But um, those of you who are familiar with the terminology around uh, learning disability healthcare, we often talk about overshadowing or transdiagnostic effects, which means that uh, someone may appear to have another disease process or an illness or, or, or whatever, but their behaviours may overshadow the diagnose, diagnosing of those illnesses. And again, with trauma, uh, we might expe experience a change in behaviours, for example, or it is assumed those behaviours are part of the normal presentation of that individual, when in actual fact, it's a direct result of the trauma. So we have to be really cognizant and alert to, to um, how people might express that type of pain. Um, I think I'm just going to move on to just one uh, one more one more slide because obviously we're also going to be we are experiencing um, a refugee crisis and uh, from the research uh, conducted by Gagello and Rogent et al looked at you know, the worst effects for people who were asylum seekers regardless of whether they had a learning disability or not and to show that mental health is made extremely vulnerable, as we would expect, by torture and other traumatic events. So things like we need to be aware of when we're talking about um, people with learning disabilities or without dis learning disabilities is the impact of social isolation, linguistic barriers and cultural differences as risk factors for people who may be taking refuge in other countries or even in different parts of the country from where, where they already live. Jonathan mentioned how disruptive it can be for people with learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities at home. If the bus route gets changed to Asda, imagine being, you know, um, transported to another part of your own country without any warning or to another country and the um, effects of that. So uh, I'm not going to read all those slides, but I just really wanted to put that into context um, for us all when we're having this discussion. And I, I think I will stop there 
um, Jonathan, if that's all right, so that we can move on to really hearing from our colleagues in the aid agencies. Thank you, Chris. I, I think it's just so hard to imagine being in, in a war zone and your direct experience of that, I think is, is invaluable. OK, um, we're going to hand over to Janet Malani to share the work of Enable Scotland and Inclusion Europe. And I believe your, your colleague has now joined as well, Razor. So, um, Razor, you should be able to unmute your mic and join, I believe. I'm not sure. Uh, Razor, are you able to try and unmute your mic? Can you hear me? Hello, yes. everybody. Razor, would you like to introduce yourself because you you weren't you weren't able to do that uh, when we did the introductions? Yeah, uh, my name is <clears throat> Razor Kravchenko, and I represent all Ukrainian and Jew coalition for persons with intellectual disabilities, and we are uh, an umbrella organization for 118 uh depots and uh, service agencies for people with intellectual disabilities and if to say about the number it is more than uh, 1400 uh, thousand families okay. um, these uh, dpos are mainly uh, established by the mothers i am myself a mother of a, a son 38 years old and so I'm in the advocacy uh, for again for 28 years and uh, the grassroots organization Jirela, which I also still the chair, uh, was organized 28 years ago. And for the coalition of 118, I was the founder and for 15 years I had been executive director. Now uh, the younger person is the executive. And uh, if to say about the current situation, um, well, first of all, I must say that before, even before the war, we had uh, regressive changes in Ukraine uh, as for the policies uh, uh, for persons with intellectual disabilities as uh, three years before the war, uh, even the uh, sub-law about group homes uh, was cancelled and we only have either institution or uh, the full load of care lies on the family. And uh, besides, our coalition started the daycare program, which was financed by the uh, public funds, national uh, budget, and then it was also cancelled two years before the war. So a very sharp uh, situation when uh, regressive changes in uh, the process, very slow process of prevention and, uh, of institutionalization, uh, then a very rough, I would say, um, uh, reformation of psychiatric care with uh, um, significant cut of services uh, uh, of uh, supported living, uh, psychiatric outpatient department, uh, departments, etc., etc., and then the war. Uh, when uh, the uh, financial support to all our 100 non-governmental organizations, which provided day services to adults with intellectual disabilities. So no uh, financial support and it is difficult to uh, organize day services even uh, in more safe place. Uh, for example, uh, I am myself now in 100 kilometers to the south of Kiev in a, a small town and uh, until the support from Inclusion Europe, we could not arrange. We have here, we have, uh, we own, the NGO owns transition home and we could, uh, we could take uh, some, maybe 10 clients or so, but we didn't manage. We had no uh, support to take them here to the safer place. So, now we are so grateful to Inclusion Europe, to uh, the members of Inclusion Europe for 
uh, financial support, which we uh, use to uh, provide financial aid to separate families. Uh, we already provided to about 300 families because they badly need. Some cannot receive their disability fee. Uh, some uh, have extra needs. Uh, they need uh, the, the, the biggest need uh, uh, for those who are in the families, uh, all services stopped. So the biggest need is uh, personal assistance. Uh, even our director has got the need of personal uh, assistance to her daughter. Uh, because the day services stopped and in addition to her, she has immobile mother and they're all in, on the seventh floor uh, uh, hearing the attacks, the missiles and other bombing of K she's in cave and uh, her autistic daughter is listening to all that and her autistic daughter uh, demonstrates uh, challenging behavior. Uh, which is in, in the acute phase and she is burning out uh, very significantly. And uh, practically uh, the situation of each particular person with intellectual disability depends on the uh, potential, on the uh, capacity of the family. And uh, <clears throat> if uh, the person is adult, like mine, 38 or 40 or something like that, the mothers are not able to evacuate, to, to, to go out uh, of their places. And so uh, they are in, in uh, where, where the war starts, they remain there. Uh, the our, uh, chair of our board is in Mariupol and she can't move out. She's in the cellar and her uh, car uh, was ruined by bombing and so she has the only possible way out when uh, Russian invaders will take her to uh, to Russia because uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, government organizes uh, only evacuation from Mariupol on their own cars and her own car is ruined so she's waiting for no one knows for what. And um, so uh, situation is different. Institutions are also different. Some are in the safer place, but uh, we know definitely that two institutions were bombed, uh, one in Kyiv, uh, uh, but uh, the administration knew that they're situated in uh, the risk, in the place of risk. So they were moved to uh, the biggest hospital, uh, mental hospital in Ukraine. Imagine that uh, 300 clients of the boarding home institution, uh, welfare institution, uh, moved to, to the mental hospital for 700 patients. So it is a big, big uh, concentration kind of, I don't know, camp or so. And, Mm, of course, uh, many, quite a lot of staff uh, moved with their families and so uh, they feel uh, lack of uh, hands, lack of staff, lack of the opportunity to uh, provide um, food and particularly to provide care. And uh, another matter, another acute problem is excess uh, to medications, particularly for two groups, uh, for psychotropic uh, and for anti-epilepsy, uh, particularly in those cases when uh, a medical prescription is necessary even to purchase. Although people may have no money, but even if they have money, they need medical prescription and uh, the uh, psychiatric outpatient departments do not work. Uh, and they have no prescriptions. And um, we even don't know how to, uh, we received already our organizations, our organization received already uh, two uh, humanitarian, uh, two, uh, two pieces of humanitarian aid, two, two convoys of humanitarian aid, uh, but also it is difficult to, to uh, to drop it to the places where separate families live. 
it is easy, of course, uh, to to bring it to boarding homes and to mental hospitals, but uh, uh, families live uh, separately and uh, it is difficult to bring to the families uh, whether it's an adult with behavioral difficulties and an elderly mother. And uh, now uh, I'm grateful to Milan particularly uh, for the uh, opportunity to purchase fuel for your mother because now we have 18 people ready to move on a minibus or on a rent bus I don't know so far who will drive it because it's difficult it's difficult even with the money to purchase fuel there are uh, queues it's difficult to find driver and uh, all, all all this but we're trying our best to move those uh, 18 persons from Kiev uh, to Poland and then to Denmark, uh, where they were uh, being waited for. And so I don't know how to um, how to prioritize problems, and particularly how to access each particular family, and how to access how to evaluate the overall picture, the overall. Uh, problem because with those um, regressive changes, we even uh, Ukraine even changed the uh, the system of um, uh, statistics. Currently, we have uh, both groups are uh, kind of calculated together: people with uh, psychosocial disabilities and people with intellectual disabilities. The last figure on intellectual disability we had before the war. So uh, 2013, and we know that uh, we had about uh, 100,000 people with disability state, statutes, status due to uh, learning uh, difficulty. And uh, the rest were had uh, psychosocial disabilities. Now the last figure was both groups. Um, had uh, two uh, hundred sixty-one thousand. So this is the, and the figure is a few times better than uh, WHO says. Uh, for example, um, disability um, percent is seven percent of our population have disability at all official disability, uh, which is twice better. Seven percent is twice better than the report of uh, the World Bank and WHO. So that's uh, the, the situation. We know what we need now, but we don't know if, if there is uh, humanitarian aid. It's difficult to get access of right. each particular family. And in the nearest future, when it finishes, we will, of course, need rehabilitation. Uh, many people with intellectual disabilities will remain without care. We had it uh, with COVID and we addressed uh, the cabinet of ministers, we addressed the president, nothing, uh, no one of our proposals were taken into account that we need uh, at least uh, the beginning of group homes, the beginning of uh, supported living. Currently there are, for the whole Ukraine, of 40 million people, we have only three supported living departments. And this supported living is when one assistant, personal assistant is shared by five people with intellectual disabilities with 40 hours of the working load, which means that, uh, you know, eight hours, including uh, their travel to the home. So it is nothing for people with intellectual disability. And it is on, it was only in Kiev woman and uh, a small town uh, near Kharkiv, Chuguyev. So only three. All the rest are either institu uh, in the institution or uh, with the uh, family totally dependent on their families. So that's, that's the situation. Right, so I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about the, the difficulties you and your son are facing and all the families are facing, but thank you so much for sharing. It, it really helps to open our eyes to to what's happening. It's it's invaluable. Um, so thank you so much. And 
thank you for for dialing in from where you are as well i, I can't imagine what it, it must be like right now um Jan and Milan, this feels like a really good time to bring you both in and talk about what, what's happening. I'm happy to have Milan shall I start and then I'll, I'll hand over to you just to talk a bit more specifically about Inclusion Europe's action. But um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, all of us have just um, watched in, in horror and, and feeling really helpless since the start of the, um, the start of the war. And I think we've been really grateful to be to have continued to be part of the Inclusion Europe movement um, at this time more than ever. Um, our Chief Executive Teresa is Vice President of Inclusion Europe and our sort of first priorities were to be in contact with Milan um, who has been able to coordinate conversations with people like Raisa and help us really understand what reality is and how we can try to take good intentions of really wanting to do something and turn that into an action plan um, as far as possible to, to, to demonstrate help and, and support and solidarity. Um, so our priority at UK level has been to work to, um, to coordinate around three um, courses of action. Um, the first, um, to raise the profile of the, the plight of people who have learning disabilities and their family carers in, in the Ukraine. Um, clearly, it's a dreadful situation for all Ukrainian citizens right now, but for all the reasons that Riza has outlined and the reasons that, that Christine outlined earlier in her presentation, there are really specific challenges faced by individuals, adults, children and families of people who have learning disabilities. And we've been working really hard to raise the profile of, of those um, challenges with decision makers at UK government, at Scottish Government level um, and through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and really asking them to just be aware of that and to take any diplomatic and humanitarian options open to them um, to ensure that help and support gets through. And part of that has been about liaising with Milan and, and, and RISA and understanding where people are and, and, and where institutions are and um, what, where those populations are, are, are situated. Um, so that's been the first priority has been to raise the profile um, and actually Teresa has a meeting with the uh, office again on Monday coming to provide an update and um, where we'll be able to give live information on the basis of, of, of RISE's information. Um, the second um, priority has been to take urgent action where we can uh, coordinate that um, and as RISA and Milan have identified in um, fundraising and getting direct um, cash into families in need in Ukraine has proven to be a, a critical urgent priority. There are obviously lots of um, really fantastic fundraising initiatives happening across the UK um, led by organisations, led by aid organisations, led by newspapers um, and so on and so forth. Um, but we agreed that there was real value in a targeted fundraising appeal that's targeted directly at families and individuals affected by learning disability in Ukraine, which actually those wider, um, you know, broader fundraising appeals will not be able to target. So um, so Milan will talk a wee bit more about how that's been coordinated and how the, the money is, is getting through to families directly. But I'm really pleased to report that this week, um, UK organisations, including Enable Scotland, including MENCAP, including the Richmond Fellowship here in Scotland um, and including Learning Disability England have been able to collaborate um, and raise over £60,000 just this week um, that will be donated to Inclusion Europe as of Monday um, and should hopefully now start to find its way through into, into families um, supported through ISIS organisation. Um, so in really practical ways, that's been one of the, the most impactful ways we've been able to offer support. We are really interested next in seeking to coordinate some, some work across the, the UK government Homes for Ukraine scheme. Um, and we're looking to try to establish how we can possibly think about matching families in the UK who have a family member who has a learning disability or perhaps have a professional interest in, in, in that field and to be able to match those opportunities with families who have children with learning disabilities and who are seeking to, to, to seek refuge um, from Ukraine and the UK. So that's an emerging priority, but we hope that beyond fundraising, that can be the next practical action that we can seek to coordinate. And then beyond that, looking ahead, um, as, as, as Riza I think is starting to also, is, is looking at how we can support the efforts to then rebuild the health and social care 
um, system um, that that Ukraine and the Ukrainian people will require once we get to um, once we get through this conflict. So, um, and we don't have all the answers to that right now. So I think Raisa has highlighted some of the, the challenges that were existing anyway. Add the war on top of that, and it's it's not a pleasant picture. So, um, I think this has to be the beginnings of a, a longer term relationship with our Ukrainian citizens, uh, friends, and colleagues, um, and we stand ready to be part of the efforts to coordinate that. So, um, so that's a, a hopefully a, a useful overview of the practical steps that enable Scotland has sought to coordinate through our membership of Inclusion Europe. Um, and um, I'll perhaps hand to Milan now to talk through the the work that, that Milan has been coordinating at European level. Yeah, thank you. So I think that uh, basically to, to follow up on what Reza and Jan were saying, uh, we as Inclusion Europe, we, uh, both of organizations, Enable and, and the coalition are our members and we've been involved uh, from the very beginning. And uh, I'd say two main areas. One is to raise awareness about the issues that families and people with intellectual disabilities who cannot leave Ukraine face. And second, and try to get them some help uh, if possible, and that help is uh, in the form of money at this point. Um, there are some 260,000 people with intellectual disabilities in Ukraine, and Raisa has already described the situation for, let's say, the two main categories to, to put it this way. One is the, the, the people that live with their families in the community, use the community based services, uh, many of which are part of, of the network that RISA represents. To them, the main challenges are around getting basic supplies of food, medicine, uh, but also anything else that is um, required in this situation. Also about being able to shelter, to just shelter from from the shelling because uh, shelters are inaccessible in, let's say, the, the physical mobility kind of way, but also it, it is, of course, incredibly uh, challenging to be in shelter with hundreds of others when somebody has autism on some, some forms of, of intellectual disabilities or things uh, or other things like that. So that makes it basically impossible to use these things. So people are essentially staying in their basements or or covering in, in bathtubs uh, and, and hoping that they will survive. That's one of the main challenges. And also for those who or the and, and the the other one is that the evacuation itself is of course incredibly uh, difficult. Um, Raisa talked about the issue in Mariupol, which which possibly is one of the worst areas right now, but it is difficult from anywhere. The the routes and we had a speaker last week who who said it takes uh, six seven days to travel from uh, Kiev to Lviv. Um, so that makes an evacuation for somebody who needs assistance or some some sort of other may have medical needs, I guess near to impossible. So that's why we are focusing on on uh, supporting the people who cannot leave. the 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 second category in this thinking is also the people and institutions. There are various um, numbers on this and, and they they differ widely but there is definitely at least 80,000 children with or without disabilities in institutions in in Ukraine and there is anything between 30,000 to 100,000 adults in institutions in Ukraine and again the challenges essentially are around the uh, the, the direct danger from the warfare, but also that many of these places would be, uh, and I, we've heard, I don't have it confirmed, but in, in some places I think it already happened, abundant as, as the staff essentially left and evacuated. Uh, in many others, they have problems with elect, um, supplies of energy or food or 
and um, it's still quite a strong winter in Ukraine at this point. So uh, before I also get to it, I'm, I think it's part of the picture as to add that also, of course, uh, is the situation about refugees. So uh, even though we focus on the people who cannot leave, I just want to add for context that it, uh, it, it both the internally displaced people who remain in Ukraine, the western part, and those who leave uh, Ukraine and reach Poland, Romania, and other countries, it looks like um, something around 10% of them are people with disabilities. Uh, we had colleagues from our member in Poland who said last week that uh, every day they have 100 people arriving who have high uh, levels of support needs. And this is an aspect of a refugee influx in Europe that, that I don't think anybody's seen before, even in, uh, let's say, in the previous uh, uh, the previous migrant migration uh, influx in, in, in Europe. Uh, this number of refugees with disabilities, I don't think is has any precedence. And uh, that's an important element, what we are also doing with our colleagues here. Uh, the, the, the other European um, disability organizations just advocating with the relevant agencies, the United Nations, European Union, and the, and the national level, that their response is aware of these issues and aware of the disability specifics. So far, I must say it's, it's um, not looking terribly good in their preparedness. Uh, to be able to provide and take into account the disability specific needs. So I just wanted to put that there. Maybe we can return to it with some question afterwards. And now briefly what what we're doing and John and, and uh, Raisa have already outlined it. So be besides the advocacy, we essentially collecting money both through a direct individual fundraiser online where people can contribute and through partnerships like Enable is leading and in, in many other countries, uh, collecting money that we can send to RISA's organization and their members in Ukraine. At this point, we can reach uh, a lot of them where, they, where the money can still help. So they can access the money and they can buy things with the money, which is uh, significant in many aspects. First, of course, they can buy food and whatever else is needed, but also um, other means of support. As Raisa was saying, like there, it's important to be able to pay somebody to drive somewhere. It is important to be able to pay someone to take care of the disabled family member, because that's one of the uh, one of the aspects of the situation is also that it's not only a matter of money or a lack of um, supplies in some areas, it's also that this is essentially 24-7 care situation for the parents, so they cannot leave, they cannot go and do the shopping even even if they have the money and even if the shops have the supplies. So that is also important. Uh, so we are in short helping via providing money directly to the organizations such as RISAS and others across Ukraine that can distribute it directly to families and the families then can buy things. And last thing to add, this is also important because a lot of the people we are talking about are no longer receiving, let's say, state pensions or anything. So they are basically left without any money at all. So it's really important that we get get them financial support. So I'll I'll stop here. You can you can get to to more things if needed. But in a nutshell, we focus on people who cannot leave Ukraine and are in the most uh, affected, and that are in the directly affected areas and help them in this respect and then of course with the advocacy work on on refugees and on the other aspects of of this whole um, uh, tragic situation thank you so much milan yeah and, and you jen as well thank you it, 
Um, I think it, it's re so reassuring to hear that there are organisations like yours out there that are highlighting these issues, making sure that action is happening, uh, and that we can we can make a difference. Um, we shared some links in the chat that, that are helpful. Um, Milan, the links you shared was that to the the Inclusion Europe um, work that you're doing at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think the impact you're discussing on families is it's yeah it's unimaginable. Uh, and as, as Riza was saying as well, uh, you know, if you it, you rely on people going, you, your loved ones going to school or going to day services or to occupation or or just even having other people nearby that you can support. And if all of that disappears um, and you yourself are having to cope with the loss of your home and the loss of your local community and all of that trauma, it, it's just awful. Um, so thinking practically then for for people who are watching in today um sorry i'll get a little bit there um, well, can, can we just sort of summarize some of the points uh jonathan uh while, while yeah. you collect your thoughts because we've been given so much very powerful information so thank you riser jan and milan for that um you know there is a lot to think about there isn't there and you know, the, the powerful picture that Riser paints of uh, children and adults with autism and other learning disabilities trying to cope and, and their carers trying to cope with this situation. I think, you know, we all need a moment to imagine what it's like sheltering in a, in a cellar, for example, um, you know, not knowing what's coming next. I mean, it would be, it's difficult enough for us as adults who might be able to process that information but caring for someone who can't process necessarily that information must be hugely traumatic um, and thank you for telling us about you know the institutions as well and I think that was reiterated by uh, Milan as, as well in, in terms of you know staff have got lives as well and it, it, they must be torn in half if you can imagine you know um, you know, trying to flee and an organization and leaving people that you're caring for behind so i think you know our hearts and thoughts go to those people who are making those really dreadful uh, decisions um I, I did take from it also you know some things that you were talking about jan about rebuilding health and social care um and you know i think those are the sort of points we need to take you know we've got to look forward as well as what we can do at the moment so there's some looking forward stuff about you know what do we do when things settle to some point where we can do something but the the, the for now things that um you know raising awareness and i saw some lovely bits in the chat about people saying you know maybe that's something we can do by contacting our local um media outlets for example um and i think you know it's all that stuff about how do we get you know really essential supplies in for people you know medicine and um uh, uh, stuff like that so and then of course the refugee issues which i must admit i hadn't thought about in the detail that you've painted milan about you know refugee camps aren't built for disabled people are they and and particularly for people with intellectual disabilities so just to sum that up uh Jonathan, before we move on to what do we do, I guess? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to make light of, of this. So I remember um, Oxfam posting a picture from their, their charity shops here of piles of books of the Da Vinci Code uh, and saying we don't need any more of the Da Vinci Code. And, and I think we've heard similar warnings come from aid agencies that, you know, if if you're dropping off food, random food donations in random places, you can't guarantee that people are getting exactly what they need and um, that they're not getting a million of one thing and nothing of another. Um, and so I suppose I, for people I've spoken to so far, I've been encouraging them not to do those kind of donations, but to go to aid organisations. So, so as it can be strategically managed, what support is going in and make sure it gets to the right place. And I just wondered if you had any further advice on that. Yeah, so I think I think you're right, and I, and I think you know um, 
that's the journey we went on with our colleagues in Inclusion Europe was we want to help. How can we and, and what practically is going to make the biggest difference? And we've been in that fortunate position to then have direct conversations with Risa and, 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 and Julia and, and, and other families. Um, and it's been very clearly communicated back to us that the best way to support right now is to make those donations so that Inclusion Europe then can act as that intermediary and get the cash to the families and in the communities where they are best required. And that allows that, um, that those individuals then to direct the support in the way that's going to best meet their needs, whether that's paying someone to drive your car or paying someone to go and get your petrol and then paying for the petrol or um, or, or, or supporting someone to come in and, um, and provide you with some, some extra time so that you can get out to the shops, as Milan says, in the hope then that there are supplies and, and whatnot. So I think that it, it, it's impossible to be prescriptive really about what and how that support must feel. And should be and, and we can't judge that and we can't assess what that's likely to be but we've heard from those families that that's the sort of support and we're fortunate through Milan's organisation that we have the opportunity to direct in that way. Are you able to share details of how to contribute to that Milan, how, to, how we can support what your organisation's doing? Yes, of course. So um, there is a, essentially two main ways. There is a direct page I will post while I stop talking the, the, the link directly to that uh, where every, anybody can make a donation directly with a credit card or there is essentially a bank account number where people can make transfers. So there are uh, so besides, let's say these direct individual contributions, there is what, what we mentioned, what what uh, Enable Scotland and others are doing. That also organizations are organizing their own fundraisers or or collaborating with others to collect money and then making larger transfers to us. And and we basically serve here as let's say a coordination point for the coalition in Ukraine because uh, it's also just to take into account that all of this requires a lot of let's say administrative work and communication and making sure that the bank accounts are still working and the people that have access to the bank accounts have still access to the bank accounts and to prevent that the people in Ukraine who have already enough to worry about would have to answer all these things individually to every donor we've basically stepped in uh, maybe just to clarify as well for some some context we are not a humanitarian organization we are an advocacy organization uh, uh basically four or five people in in brussels and this is a completely new experience for us and uh, we are in response to what we see that uh, people in ukraine need trying to get them the money as quickly as possible because we can still see that it makes a difference that was something i was wondering about actually milano because i know that a lot of um international companies have put um in, in positions on on russia um uh, to try and in, encourage them to um change their course of action but um I'm aware that a lot of you Ukrainians have family in Russia, and I wondered if they would have, if that would also affect their finances as well. Whether there was any side effect from that, and I suppose also the cost of living increases we're seeing, the rises in fuel prices. I'm guessing all of that's happening in Ukraine as well. For Isa to answer better, but I think that that point. Um... In most of those areas, people have um, sorts of disrupt or urgent needs to hear yeah. about. Uh, and then, of course, I, in, in the safer parts of Western Ukraine, it's uh, you know, safer in relative terms. Russia is bombing those areas as well, but uh, not as heavily as, as east of Ukraine. Uh, of course, it creates um, its own. Uh, problems uh, and situation with the influx of refugees with, with mm. also the services. I think that uh, 
the, the services that would normally the, or the buildings and, and centers that would normally serve people with disabilities are in some cases, I think that's exactly Raisa's case, uh, basically serving now just the internal refugees to anybody. So, I mean, there's a lot of uh, obviously a, a huge scale of uh, problems that, that people have to just deal with on, on daily basis uh in order to make sure that they stay secure and, and survive in this situation um so maybe just to add on on that I mean, the, the we as inclusion europe as an organization are providing the financial help directly because that's the quickest uh, way that that we can do and as i said we we know that it makes difference others from our networks and other disability organizations are providing other forms of support. So yeah, our member from Lithuania has recently driven two cars to Kiev with, with supplies. Uh, our member from Romania did the same to the western part of Ukraine. And there are many, many others basically have, having all in common the need to provide directly to organizations or, or families of people with intellectual disabilities because we are not sure that if we all just relied on let's say the general humanitarian organizations that this would be the case mm -hmm. so there's a huge response in all kinds of manners uh in the in this respect also including um supporting evacuations of some that is something that we as inclusion europe cannot get involved we don't have the capacity we don't have but but we are well aware of of what is happening there's uh whole institutions being um of of several hundred people being evacuated and then then being kind of supported in all these people moving to uh, Germany, Austria, Poland, whenever we have groups mm -hmm. of people arriving to Denmark uh, and then also then relocating from the border countries uh, further to to Spain in all of uh, to Spain, like, like to, to other countries like recently to Spain. Uh, and that all is just just to, I guess, reiterate what I was saying at the beginning, like this is unprecedented in the level of people with disabilities that are arriving in Europe as part of the refugee crisis. And this, that, that's, there are all sorts of support to that. Important element, just to maybe uh, add one, one thing, and I stop talking after that, there's a new thing emerging. <laughs> Just yesterday, I received some communication on that. that big, there will be big issues with staff. Uh, some countries in Europe have already had problems with staff shortages before the war. And now with um, having an, uh, a large numbers of people with disabilities coming in, this will also make it uh, make it more urgent to, to many of them. And there is the issue that, that sometimes the staff from these services, these institutions, institutions arise with, with, with the people, but they are not allowed to work essentially. So there's also some bureaucratic obstacles, let's say, that to be overcome. I just, I, I could go on for many longer, shut up thank, here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and I think, you know, you've made some, you know, really, again, important points and, and Please thank your colleagues from Lithuania and Romania because I know how frightening those journeys can be in into areas. So you know, you know, really appreciate obviously what they've done to to drive in and take supplies in, in, into an area when everyone else is trying to get out of it. I just wonder, Jonathan, if it's a good time to pick up some things from the chat as well. Um, okay. uh, uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues Kirsty and Hannah um, if there's any particular questions they've picked up and while they come back online hopefully with us um, you know there were some questions directly about uh, you know is there a team that can be sent or any practical level of support for people with learning disabilities are is there you know we hear about disaster teams being flown into areas don't we is there something bearing in mind what you've just said Milan about 
um, you know, staff shortages and, you know, people not being able to work. And associated with that message was, can health workers or those of us who are qualified volunteer in any way to do anything? I know my line manager's on, on the call as well, so she's probably going, oh, no. But, you know, the important thing is, you know, what can we do um, to, you know, to, to help? And, and I'll let Kirsty and um, Hannah come in onto that call as well. But I thought if we could start there. Thanks, Chris. I don't know about you, Kirsty, but certainly the theme of some of the questions I was picking out is people are really just wanting to know what support we can actually provide. And people are wanting information um, to share, um, information about sort of what organisations are there providing quite specific and targeted support. And, and some of the other more practical things that like people are asking about whether GPs can link in with organisations to donate things such as medication. Um, and as you were just saying, really, Chris, about, you know, is there any, um, you know, way in which people can volunteer their services should they wish, wish to do so. So I think the general theme of the questions is very much about what can we specifically do and I think that's a very kind of overarching across all of the questions. I don't know if that was your, your feeling as well Kirsty. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I wonder, um, so it, it, it's a great question, it's kind of the only question now that emerges isn't it, when you hear of the, the challenges you just want to think what can we practically do. Um, I saw some questions in the chat box as well about the position of the mainstream, if you can call them that, mainstream humanitarian and aid organisations, so UNICEF and the DEC, and, and how they are responding to this particular um, population. Um, I think it's fair to say we have we have raised these issues, we've raised them directly with the board of UNICEF, we have been in contact with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and we are doing everything that we can to, um, to promote the needs of, of this population. Um, but probably also fair to say that they are exceptionally busy and, and working to, to set up infrastructure for, that, that works for the, the whole population. So I think the more that we can do with a singular voice to, to promote those issues, perhaps, you know, joining forces with the Royal College of Nursing and, and you know, um, putting a communication into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and to UNICEF to explore um, or to, to, to I suppose, um, enhance the, the message that's coming through from Inclusion Europe about this population, but also to start offering that and exploring what that practical support might look like from nursing professionals, from GP professionals and um, from medical suppliers um, in the UK and how we could work together. I think that could be a really practical step. Um, as I say, our chief executive is meeting with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office on Monday, so we could certainly in link these conversations together and then perhaps work to, to, to get something in writing. Um, but I think the more that we can do um, to, to promote the fact that we are behind this population and we are or here, we have the expertise um, and we want to help, um, the more we do that, the better. Okay. Just want to yeah, go on, Jonathan. I'm sure what you've got to say is more important than what I've got to say. <laughs> I'll see then. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, definitely what, what John was saying about basically talking to whoever might do something about this is, is also very important because I've already mentioned that the response of the humanitarian agencies is uh, leaves a lot to be desired in terms in terms of taking disability related needs and issues into account. So making these agencies and institutions aware of the needs and then responsive to them is doing a lot of work already. Uh, on the more practical side of things, uh, I won't go into any details as that we, we can't handle all, all these demands practically, but for more specific questions about supporting people uh, directly, I, I, I guess I would recommend looking at the neighboring countries and the organizations in the disability sector that are working there, especially in Poland, which has a tremendous in, in influx of, of um, uh, of, of refugees. I think Poland has now by now like nearly two million refugees. Uh, and the uh, disability organizations there are doing a lot of work. Uh, and but they need 
support both in terms of personnel. I cannot help in saying how that's supposed to work. There is a lot of bureaucratic issues, so I would just say yes, there is a need and the best people to talk to are the people from the Polish organizations. If you go to our website, I shared here the links, you will find links to the um, to the Polish organizations as well. It, it's best to talk to them, I think, uh, and to others in, in, in different countries in this respect, or the national authorities in, in those countries, because otherwise we'd, we'd also, so, we don't want to be a bottleneck and just blocking all this communication. So I think it's just best to try with the very practical inquiries and offers to look at the national level at this stage. And uh, another aspect, yeah, looking at some of the questions here, there are also, the, let's say, the material needs around equipment. That's definitely something that we heard from the Poland, and it will be the case anywhere else. Uh, wheelchairs, especially wheelchairs for children, uh, any kind of, any, all kinds of accessibility and and and, and equipment, beds, uh, things that people with disabilities uh, would need for for them to be comfortable and to be able to 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 uh, uh, to to fun function in, in the environment that is very much needed a lot of it still is of course possible to just buy so it's it's just money helps here it's the same but then there are things that are just not so easy to to buy because they must be individualized or specific or there are just not enough of them as i said one of those needs you can you can look look at the article we have on the website about one is as equipment for children with disabilities so yeah, there are there are definitely, let's say, the material things. And this I guess as we'll be moving forward, just one last thing to add, there will definitely also be some sort of a need for trainings uh, and, and general support for people, so training for staff uh, and things like that, so they can properly support people as as they arrive and as they as they start to to to. Yeah, I mean, settle away in the new surroundings, whatever that may be in, in the situation. There's been a couple of mentions of the um, Disaster Emergency Committee in the chat uh, and where people should be do directing their their support to. I, I suppose what I really want to say is wherever you direct your support to, it's amazing and you're doing something to help and something to make a difference. So don't worry about is it going the right way. But um, the, the UK government are directing people to to um, to put their funding that way. Is there anything we can do to influence the Disaster Emergencies Committee to make sure they're prioritising people, prioritising people with learning disabilities? I would say yes. So I, I think that has to be the other um, urgent priority um, at UK level is to work to influence UNICEF Disasters Emergency Committee from Commonwealth Office to raise the profile of people with learning disabilities and family carers and ensure that targeted support is, is, is made available. Um, the reason that the Inclusion Europe has set up the direct route to families is for something quite specific and quite different, which is the, the, the reasons that Milan and, and Raisa have outlined. But yes, I think that'd be very welcome. And I think if that that approach comes from bodies, you know, such as the Royal College of Nursing Learning Disability Network, and that would hold quite a lot of weight. Okay. Right, so, um, it's, it's great to see your face. Thank you for, for joining us again. Um, I just wondered if it was worth coming back to you and seeing if you had any further thoughts on anything we've discussed so far. Difficult to say. It's difficult to uh, to have access for all families and all institutions uh, to your uh, help. And first of all, I'm very uh, uh, much towards the profound work of Inclusion Europe and of uh, Milan. Uh, and we're so grateful for um, the attention and their understanding and their support. And uh, I want to uh, explain all those mothers. Uh, it is uh, now about 300 
families who already received this individual aid. Uh, and we explained that it comes from inclusion Europe, it comes from European people. And uh, uh, in addition to money, they feel support. And it is very much important. And uh, we will try our best now. Uh, uh, there are only three of us who have a volunteer who will provide information uh, support. And she is a very uh, qualified and experienced. So uh, we, would, we would appreciate highly your advice about information, about what kind of information would you advise us to provide, maybe some stories, maybe some pictures or so, but we started this uh, kind of work and uh, we would uh, appreciate your advice in this regard. I, I do realize that it is necessary. We do realize now we got used to the situation because the first uh, maybe two weeks uh, it was two weeks it was uh, we, we we were so much uh, uh, impressed we uh, we never ever suggested uh, that the aggression may, might come from russia and now we are more used to the situation we understand that, uh, that it is for a long time it won't even if uh, the battles themselves may finish in some weeks or some months but uh, the ruining are so significant, maybe only five or so Western uh, regions out of 24, uh, 25 Ukrainian regions uh, are not um, so much involved and not attacked. Even Lviv region, which is a Western region, was attacked. Uh, so very, very little amount of places, very few localities uh, which have no uh, ruining. All, all is being ruined. And uh, we will overcome it for for years. And um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, because you are working with people with intellectual disabilities and you know that these people are least prioritized. And we do realize that... Uh, these families and these institutions suffer mostly. And we see uh, we have a good relationship with our institutions on human rights. We have a few ombuds, uh, the parliamentary ombudsman on human rights, the governmental on ombudsman on uh, the rights of persons with disabilities, the presidential a representative on barrier-free environment. And we see that uh, their reaction is not sy systemic, kind of. It is uh, just uh, some maybe governmental, for example, on Boots helped to move a group of 30 people. So, but no solutions on the national level, on the policy level. And uh, we would, of course, need your support in this regard because uh, institutions are cheaper and we have uh, very strong concerns that institutionalization uh, both of children and adults with intellectual disabilities will be reinforced. Uh, whatever the uh, result of the war. And so, and um, we would, of course, appreciate highly your support in, in our advocacy uh, efforts, because um, this is the matter of reputation of Ukraine. And if all the European community helps us with this, with the advocacy, with the, uh, reminding that man, many people with intellectual disabilities are expectedly going to... Uh, remain without care. And uh, it is, we rely on your help uh, that they are not in the institutions, they're in the community, that they're supported in the community. So this advocacy aspect is also very much, imp uh, very important for us. And we know that even COVID showed that many people with intellectual disabilities remained uh, with a little care or without care at all. Uh, and our <clears throat> government reacted uh, strangely. So they 
uh, did not answer what 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 will happen to these people how uh, the government how uh, how the uh, on political level in which way these people are going to be uh, protected no answer and uh, the war will uh, um, bring even even more people without care people with intellectual disabilities without care and of course we rely on your help in the dialogue with the national government. When this time comes, when it is not bombing, when it is not missiles. So we would appreciate highly your support in this regard as well. Thank you. And I think that's definitely part of the conversation. And, you know, there's been lots of... Um, in the chat, I don't know, um, Kirsty and Hannah, if you want to pull things through from the chat. Um, th there is just one point I'd like to pick up. There was something about how we support people here, vulnerable people here, because we know that individuals who might be in in care or at home may have the TV on and are being um, seeing the dreadful images from your country that you know that what's going on for you and we you know we we see some of those images um i know that uh, there is an organization in ireland who we did in, invite and maybe we can invite to another conversation who'd created an easy read version of information for people with learning disabilities and i think we all need to be very aware of the potential harm to people in other countries who are um experiencing that trauma because we know post-traumatic stress disorder you don't actually have to be in a situation you can see it on the tv screens you can hear it to feel the trauma as well so i think we need to be very aware of those people um thank you kirsty and hannah i'm aware that we're coming up to half past two we did say that we'd try and keep it to half past two though we'll keep the lines open a bit longer because we realize that most of you are on your lunch break the recording will be available and people have asked if they can use it for teaching. Yes, please do. Um, uh, you know, it's this is a conversation we want to have out in the open. And I know that Jonathan will sum, sum up about what do we do next um, later. But first of all, Hannah and Kirsty, anything else? You're doing a marvellous job watching the chat. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I think most things that have been raised in the chat have been covered, um, but really just to echo the amount of support that's in the room and the amount of people that would like to do something, yeah. um, whatever that might be. So there's there's definitely some follow up actions that, that are needed um, and people that are willing to get involved in that and more than willing. That's that's an understatement. Um, also, a huge, huge um, heartfelt Thank you, and um, just uh, I'm speechless. Just, just um, sort of listening to everything. So, just the the, the sentiment within the room, um, and particularly to raise there and and everything that you're you're doing and going through and support. And thank you for coming and talking to us because um, it's been incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. Hannah, did you miss anything? Sorry. No, I don't think if it did. I think it's just overwhelming support. And actually, there's just people are really wanting to know what to do. And there, there was several offers of help in the chat. And so I think one of the actions is going to be just kind of collating everything that's there and seeing if we can coordinate all of, you know, everyone that's included um, and obviously start to go through that in a really sort of practical way. But no, I think you captured everything there. Thank you, Kirsten. And we ought to say that um, hopefully if this webinar process has worked well, we have captured all the emails of everyone who applied to be registered for this event. So um, through your registration process, so we should be able to um, try and summarise some of these things and also send you the link um, later on. But Jonathan, back to you. Uh, I was just going to sort of summarise by saying that, you know, I think when we, we see all these dreadful images of what's happening in Ukraine and we can feel quite helpless or not know what to do uh, and we can feel personally affected by it ourselves. I think today is a really good example of what we can do. Um, 
I know for myself hearing about the great work of Enable Scotland and Inclusion Europe that fills me with reassurance that there are good people out there making a difference that are, are raising these issues um, and, um, and making a difference. Um, so thank you so much for coming and sharing what you're doing today. I, I, it really does mean the world. Um, for you, for attendees, if you want to carry on making a difference, I follow um, the work of Enable Scotland and Inclusion Europe, find their Twitter accounts, um, look at their websites, look at what they're doing and look at how you can support what they're doing. Share, disseminate, get it out, get the news out there about what's happening uh, and uh, and look at how you can make other people as aware of what's going on out there. Um, and I think the idea of writing to MPs is great. I, I think it enables Scotland are potentially considering uh, a, a, a campaign towards MPs around the houses for Ukrainians. Um, so it may be worth waiting a little while for that to happen, but there's nothing to stop you writing to your MP now and saying, oh, I am appalled about what's happening to people who learn disabilities in Ukraine, and I want to make sure that action is happening. Yeah, I would totally agree with that, Jonathan. I think, yes, um, go for it, you know, use your own voices, use your own community voices and, and, and do that. Um, when it comes to how we will organise to get people to um, get in touch specifically with the politicians about a specific issue, we're just waiting to establish what that ask is likely to be. And at the moment, it feels like we are most likely to put some pressure to bear on coordinating that, that approach to the Homes for Ukraine system. In, in the UK for families that are able to make it out of Ukraine and across here to the UK. There's a lot to coordinate there in terms of expertise. There's safeguarding issues to consider as well. And we think there could be real value in pulling together a network of, of interested and appropriate families um, and, and, and the individuals who can be in a position to open their doors. So, um, but I think, as I said in the chat box, you know, we're just delighted that you have also sought to stand in solidarity and start this conversation. So um, we are delighted to keep working alongside you and with you. This will be a journey. Um, and I think today's just the start of the conversation about how we can how we can support. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we've seen in the last 20 days how quickly things can change in, in any direction. And you know, we, we don't know where we're going to be this time next week. And um, I, I'm personally committed to, to carrying this forward, as I know everyone here on the call is. Um, if you've uh, got any thoughts or suggestions, um, I've already popped my email in the in the chat. You, um, but do feel free to get in touch with us outside of this conversation. Um, but yeah, we, we there is definitely a commitment to carry on this this support. And and Rosa, just final word to yourself, just because you know I, I think it is so moving to hear of you in the middle of it all, right there. Um, battling day in day out with your son and and, and what, all the support that you're giving to all the other families a, a huge thank you for you and I really appreciate your time today for coming here so thank you so much thank you and uh, uh, we are so much impressed with the solidarity you all express Milan um, and thank you first of all to organize all the uh, all all the network of European organizations and it is a very um, astonishing example of solidarity among people, among the families and among uh, professionals of people with intellectual disabilities. And um, since these are uh, people abandoned and, and, and people of low priority, being together is the uh, best strategy to fight for the better lives for full implementation of the human rights of persons with intellectual disability and uh, all our families are so grateful to you thank you on that note we will close the session there thank you all for taking the time to be part of this as we said it will be recorded and we will be sharing it far and wide